Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. I hope that you're having a wonderful Thursday, at least here for us in the States. If you are somewhere else in another, another country, it might even be early Friday morning. But we are thankful for you and for your interest in studying the Bible and factoring the truth of God's word into your life. And our goal is to factor it into our lives first and then sharing it with you that you may find benefit in it as well. Let's go ahead and bring everyone into the study this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. We are Good limited call. to three. So Tom is back. Bob, you were here last week with Brian and I, weren't you? Yeah, Brian's Tom. gone. Yeah, you said yeah. he's out camping, isn't he, probably? Yeah, I think with right. Dunnigan. Yeah, I wonder if that yeah. means his wife kicks him out of the house and he's got to live outside for a while. Probably. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it's camping or glamping. Oh, glamping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's see. Let me mute my phone. I forgot to do that earlier. All right, who all has joined us today so far? We have uh, David Clark, we have Gregor Hinckley, and Caleb Davis, Hedy Brickell, and maybe others. And uh, if, you, if this is the first time you've joined us for our study, we'd encourage you to at least tell us your name, even just your first name and where you're from. If you've joined us on our Facebook page, then you can drop a comment on this live video stream. If you've joined us on our YouTube channel, then of course you can also use the comment section or the chat section there to tell us a little bit about yourself. Just curious where people are from. But if you have any thoughts or comments, you can use those avenues to share uh, with us during the course of our study today. You can also send us email if you would like, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Wrong button, there we go questions at truthfactorlive.com or as you see on the screen there you can email us individually at the appropriate email addresses so all right gentlemen we are picking up today with john chapter 7 in verse 16 is where we'll start our discussion but what i like to do is back up to verse 10 here in just a moment just to kind of reestablish the context we have jesus he is gone he has gone down to the to the uh, feast in Jerusalem. Uh, part of what we're gonna be looking at, the problems that the Jews had with him will point back to the healing of the man uh, at the pool of Bethesda, going back to John chapter five, more than likely. That's the work that he will be referencing. And so that kind of helps to uh, fill in the question, uh, or answer the question of why were they so upset with him? Part of it has to do with his teachings, going back to the latter part of six, but, Let's see. With that being said, let's go ahead and start with verse 10. And Tom, if you would begin reading there in verse 10. Let's read through. Oh, sorry. I thought I had this figured out. Let's read through verse 19. Just kind of okay, just getting us right. into that a little bit. All right. Yeah. And I am reading from the New King James. All right. And it says, uh, uh, John 7, beginning in verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? There was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know, let, know letters, having not, never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak it on my own authority. He who speaks for him from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? All righty. Thank you, Mr. Tom. So we, we had a conversation last week about whether or not Jesus knew his letters. And especially in regards to his numbers. It was a joke I made back then. It, it, it was only funny last week. But 
So what they're yeah, questioning about last week. It was a buddy last week. <laughs> That's right. Um, so of course the people are a little perplexed, Tom, aren't they? Because here's Jesus talking about the law. He's talking about the law of Moses and he appears to have a good bit of knowledge in regards to that. But yet their observation is he's not studied at the feet of Gamel. He's not studied at the feet of the other Jewish leaders. Um, this seemed to cause he's a problem in their formal. mindset. Yeah. He has not studied formally as yeah. they perceive it. Yeah. That would be, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, his apostles would fall into the same basket with the exception oh, yeah. of Paul. Yeah. All right. So their question has to do with, of course, how did, you know, this, where did his knowledge come from since he hadn't studied it? And Tom, what is his answer for all intents and purposes in this context? Uh, well, his answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, it came from God. So that's the point. Now, on my screen, you are frozen, so I don't know if you hear this or not. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hearing you good. I'm trying to get back to where it's just, oh, my Zoom has frozen. There we go. Now we're caught up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and like I said, that I mean, he's very straightforward about it. My doctrine is not mine. It's him who sent me. So, so he's, he's tying this directly to God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bobby, any th comments on that? Well, uh, I do want to kind of go back to verse 10, deal just a little bit sure. with the, with the conflict that some perceive between his saying, I'm not going. And then he goes, but okay. he goes go after his brothers. We don't, it doesn't say how long after they left that he left. And so again, this to me justifies the position that he's just not going to go with them or with the family. He's going to go up secretly. And, uh, so anyway, I, I think there's, there's that, but as far as this question is concerned, yeah, his who sent me, they can't think that he's talking about Joseph, the carpenter. He's dead probably. Uh, he's never mentioned as being yeah. uh, alive uh, after Luke chapter 2. And so he probably did not survive to see Jesus even baptized, uh, much less enter into his uh, ministry. So jo uh, Josh, Josh, he can't really be referring to Joseph. And so they've got to know that he's referring to God uh, as having sent him. Uh, especially when he says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. And uh, that's kind of the way the Jewish Bereans felt. Because when Paul and Silas went to Berea to preach, uh, the Jewish Bereans searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. And uh, because they knew if, if, if what they said was what the father had said, then it was true. It was God's doctrine and not the doctrine of Paul and Silas. And so the same thing is true here. Uh, he did not sit, he did not study at the feet of any person uh, as far as uh, doctrinal studies are concerned. Uh, Gamaliel or Hillel or I forget who the other teacher was. Uh, you know, there are two primary Jewish teachers uh, that conflicted on the idea of divorce. One says that it has to be for adultery, and the other said, no, it can be for any reason. Uh, one of them was Hillel. I'm not sure which one he was, but at least three uh, main uh, rabbis at the time that had a very high profile and had a great deal of respect. The Apostle Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, that was his rabbi. But yeah, Jesus didn't need that. He brought the truth into the world. And thus he did not need to study the truth. But uh, not, not meaning that he didn't read the scriptures. He certainly read them. I mean, he, he read them in, in Luke chapter 
was it, what, chapter four when he went into the mm -hmm. synagogue and he read, uh, yeah. I think from Isaiah, that this day this uh, scripture is fulfilled in, in your midst. And he knew Isaiah. He knew where to go in that scroll for Isaiah, but he probably read it for their benefit. But uh, that would give him uh, more accessibility to the Father. I mean, he was in direct kind of communication with the Father on a regular basis. Every time he prayed, we know that God the Father heard him. And there were at least a few times where God the Father spoke directly to him and audibly. Uh, but also he was communicating to him uh, by way of inspiration, putting the uh, the words, the thoughts, the ideas, the teaching directly into the mind of Jesus uh, to whatever extent he needed that in his incarnate state. Okay. I feel like there's a huge discussion we could have there, but I'm going to throw it to Tom. You've got a thought, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're right. There's a lot of discussion there. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, pardon my call. Uh, um, you know, just building on what uh, Bob said there, you know, uh, Jesus is clearly appealing to God the Father. And what I find interesting is uh, the way he says it is he's basically saying, if you know the if you know the scriptures, you know that what you're anticipating as the Messiah or what the scriptures say about the Messiah, I have not contradicted that. I have backed up what I'm saying, and he's backed it up. Not he's backed it up with signs, but also if they took the time to actually search the scriptures, they would find it. You know, I, I was just thinking of a, I was just thinking of Jesus and his conversation with Nicodemus back in verse ten of chapter three, where he said, "Are you the teacher of Israel, and do you not know these things?" You know, they, they were they were versed enough in the law that yeah. they should have been able to see if they were honest and had open hearts you know what we may not have looked at isaiah this way but you know we need to consider what he's saying but they just didn't want to they they despised him i i mean i i find it amazing you know you mentioned early on the context that jesus is going to talk about this work that he did in verse 21 and probably it's going back to chapter 5 which mm -hmm. would have been a previous feast and they're still dwelling on that you know the, i i mean i mean they can't get over that he heals somebody on the sabbath because because it it, it went against them so 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 you you have that idea in this whole text and, and jesus is just making one of these statements that they honestly know and they can accuse him of blasphemy once again based upon what he says because they're not willing to consider what he says and he clearly appeals to authority, not only in what the scriptures say, but the works that he does that back up what he is saying. You know, I've also yep. wondered whether they really thought it was a violation of the Sabbath to heal or if they were just using that as a pretense. Uh, yeah. And something, something about him negative. Uh, like so many right. well, media of the day. Right. Well, knowing how picky they were, if you want to use the word for snickerty, <laughs> uh, you know, that uh, that they were in the, the laws that they created, you know, some of those ridiculous right. laws that we've read. I, I, I think it's possible that in their self-righteousness, they thought he was wrong to do it. But, you know, uh, you know I, I've, always, I've always made the point when you think about the miracles of Jesus, you know, how much work is actually involved in saying, pick up your bed and walk? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I mean, how much is involved, you know, put some spit on the ground, you know, put it in his eyes, say, go wash. You know, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's not like he was plowing a, a field or, or making a garment. He spoke and a miracle happened. So, yeah. but that just shows their blindness, which we've already talked about in John. You know, there are six days. There are six days. You can go heal on any one of those days. Well, you wouldn't have accepted it then either, by the way. But, but, uh, so, I mean, you are looking for things to pick. But I, I just think that that's how they, that's how they gain their control of the people. And Jesus was challenging their control. Right. 
So and I like what he says in verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Yeah, and, and that's the absolute that's the absolute point. Um, you know, you've got the law, and you claim to follow the law, but you're not. So, and and, and he's going to give another example of that down down. He's going to give an example there in verses 22 and following. So, well, in verse 19, there's an example. Why do you seek to kill me? Yeah, yeah. By then yeah. seeking oh, to kill oh, yeah. him was a violation of the law. Absolutely, the, yeah. especially the way they were doing it. Yeah. And that comes so, up again in chapter 8 when he tells them that they are the seed of the father, the devil. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, one thought about verse 17. Now, Tom, this does this touch on what you've already said. He makes a statement here in verse 17. He says, if anyone wills to do his will, and I had this translation capitalized the H, pointing it towards God. So if anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. This is directly stated at them because they were not willing themselves to do God's will. Had they been willing themselves to do God's will, then they would have recognized that what Jesus was saying was from God. That's true. That's yeah, yeah. yeah, they were not willing to do the, the work necessary to study and verify. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Bob mentioned it earlier, the Bereans in Acts 17. Yeah. But then verse 18 really, really touches, uh, touches home with a lot of religious leaders and very possibly preachers today, where he says, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. There are so many religious leaders who speak for their own glory. And when they seek their own glory, they won't teach the truth. They will teach things, maybe a slight variation on the truth, but at that point, it's no longer the truth. But they're doing it not for the glory of God, but for their own self-image, their own self-glory. And again, this falls back to the motive behind many of the religious leaders of that day. And a lot of money for some, for some yeah. preachers. If you yeah. preach a doctrine that is popular enough with enough people, you can really make a killing. Yep. And, and we've known that some uh, who have done that very thing and uh, uh, they have great followings, uh, but when you examine what they teach, it falls flat, it falls short mm -hmm. of the, the teaching uh, of, of God's will. And when you bring entertainment into that, that just adds to that. It becomes yeah. a type of manipulation, a, you know, and entertainment, and it's all to keep them coming back. I was going to say coming back for more, but really it's coming back to bring more. Yeah. Yeah. I heard one preacher, denominational preacher years ago, exposed himself and got a laugh for it. He says, uh, you are what you eat, so I try to eat only rich foods. Uh, but that was... His motivation, obviously, but he didn't uh, think about it being uh, telling. <laughs> well, now there, not to get too far off base, and I don't know the preacher's name. He's one of the the big big name preachers, supposedly on the TBN network or TB, oh, you yeah, know, whatever the the broad the um, religious network is. Anyway, so there's a video of him and his wife talking, and people are criticizing him because of his jet because of his mansion and everything. So he pulls up a Bible passage from the Old Testament. I can't remember That's which Copeland, it was. That's Copeland, by the way. No, it's not Kenneth Copeland. It's, it's oh, the okay. other guy. And okay, so, he, so he brings up this verse, and this verse sounds like it could be speaking favorably and God blessing it. So he asks his wife, read that verse if you would. And she says, okay, I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Well, the Amplified Version, yes, it's a broad paraphrase, but basically the point of the verse is that it was the wicked all right, that the Lord was talking about there. And he immediately began to try to, yeah, yeah, the way <laughs> it was, it was the funniest thing. Um, called it called his own self with scripture. All right. So, but this is walking in the mindset of the religious leaders of the day. And this comes back to what y'all were saying. Did not Moses give you the law yet? None of you keep it. In this case, they were trying to kill him. Matthew 23, he will give many exa examples of the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. All right. Bye. Any thoughts or any comments? 
You think? What about you at home? You have any thoughts or comments? We'd love to hear from you. If you're watching this, if you've joined us on our Facebook page, you can use the comment section that's connected with this live video stream. If you are on our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat window there, or you can send us an email, send it to questions at Simon at Seminole point, sorry, <laughs> questions at truthfactorlive.com questions at truthfactorlive.com. All right. All right. Let me double check that email. Now that I'm thinking about it, let's go ahead and proceed. Then if there's no thoughts, guys, let's go ahead and go into the next section there and let's pick up with verse 20. Bob, if you would, let's look at their response from 20 through 24. All right. Still reading from the New King James. Wait a minute. Who read a while ago? Was it Tom? It was Tom. Okay. No, sorry. Go ahead. The people answered and said, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. So their, their response is that he has a demon because he seems to be delusional. All right. Who's trying to kill you is their question to him. So when he says in verse 21, I did one work and you marvel the most recent miracle and time, you correct me if I'm wrong on this. The most recent miracle is the feeding of the multitude in chapter six, but because he then addresses doing a work on the Sabbath that points us possibly back to chapter five, when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, that was on a Sabbath day. And that created a lot of controversy at that point. Um, but what is his reasoning? I've lost Bob for just a moment there. Verse 22, what is his point here about, um, their actions? His, uh, his point. Oh, incidentally, uh, there was yeah. two miracles that we already had in between the, the one and five, the walking on water and the feeding of the 5,000. And, uh, both of those likely took place in Galilee. Yeah. So, but, so but only, that but, the, but, the 5, 000, of, but the feeding of the 5,000 would have been seen by many, the walking on oh, the yeah. water. And I did forget about that. The walking of water would yeah. have seen by, by a few. Yeah. Okay. And, anyway, and, good and, point. And, yeah. Yeah. And they're both in Galilee. So that's yeah. why we got to take this all the way back to chapter five. And, 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 okay. and, and uh, the point that Jesus is making in verse number 22 is, is uh, uh, you're sitting here judging me for what you call working on the Sabbath. And, and, we, and, uh, and as we've already pointed out, it's absurd to think what Jesus did was actually work, you know, from that standpoint. But this is just one of the many examples of there are things that happen on the Sabbath that technically would be a violation of the Sabbath, but because it was another command, it had to be dealt with. And Jesus here mentions the idea of the Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. So here, uh, to me, that would be, uh, first of all, how many babies would have to be circumcised on the Sabbath? And, and the point that I'm making is more than likely it's not just one child, more than likely it's a job. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's a job that the priests had to do and, and it required their attention for a, a length of time on the Sabbath, whatever was involved in that. And so Jesus has given the idea of you've got these two laws, the Sabbath day, because it's the eighth day, it supersedes the fact of resting every Sabbath and so on. And of course there's the misunderstanding of the Sabbath. We know there's other examples that Jesus gives in the other gospels. Also the ox falling in the ditch that you're going to save that animal's life, which is a whole lot of labor and, and those types of things. So that's what Jesus is pointing to here is their inconsistency mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. in uh, in applying God's intention for the Sabbath. Okay. Do you think there could be a small reason as to why he picked circumcision as an example? Not being crass, okay? But the, the circumcision is removing of the foreskin from a male baby. In verse 23, he says, Are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? That, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. The contrast, yeah, yeah you, you, remove, you remove something, I gave something back. Yeah. On Sabbath, uh, yeah, I, I made him whole. You know, I, I made him whole. So that that's a good point. Could be. Could it be also po- it also points out that circumcision preceded Moses. It yes, was incorporated the into the law. But that's it, a good point. And at the time of Abraham, Abraham was the first one to be commanded yeah. to command to be commanded to circumcise his sons, and Isaac was the first. first Ishmael. Uh, I, maybe it was Ishmael, the first one circumcised, and then Isaac. But uh, and so it's older than the law. Yeah, but they treated it like it was part of the law. At least that's yeah. the way it's indicated here. Yeah, and so, uh, but you do it, and you don't think anything about it being a violation of the Sabbath day. Yeah, and so why should you be angry that I make somebody well? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, just for clarification, mm-hmm. uh, we're talking about Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. That's where God makes the covenant with Abraham and circumcision begins. So Genesis it's, 17 is where the text Abraham, is. Abraham, Ishmael, and all of his servants, too. Yeah. On That's that awesome. day, exactly. Yeah. Um. So then all this helps us to understand verse 24 a little bit better. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Righteous judgment allows them to do what God has told them to do on the Sabbath day and not be in violation of the law. What Jesus did on the Sabbath day was not in any way in violation of the, the, of the Mosaic law. They were going off the way things appeared. They weren't using proper righteous judgment in their accusation. Any you know, thoughts about verse 24? Uh, today, just as, as kind of, kind of a, uh, a modern day application, I think, uh, I drew a blank. Okay. So we're obligated to come together on the first day of the week to break bread. But somebody is on their way to the church building and they have a traffic accident. Do they leave the scene of the accident and go on to the building? No. They've got to report the the accident. They've got to wait on the uh, police to survive, uh, to arrive and to investigate, to take pictures, etc. And uh, they want to get it, you know, they've got to comply with the law of the land also. And so which is more important? Well, it's not a matter of which is more important, but which is uh, maybe of the essence and, and the, uh, the, uh, the law has to be dealt with. The, the accident has to be dealt with. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's, yeah, a, uh, yeah. Yeah, ahead, there, there's, there's a lot of times where people, they're not understanding when it comes to things that might beyond our control interfere with our being at worship services. Right. You know, now, sometimes people are easily hindered. Okay. Easily hindered. Right. But other times there are certain situations just beyond our control and there needs to be understanding with that. It doesn't fall in the realm of abandoning the assembling of the saints. It's, it's like when Paul, he was out, it's possible. Paul was on a ship for two weeks. You know, you know, when he had the shipwreck going forward from that, right. well, there had to be understanding because Paul could not assemble with local saints during the course of that time period. But anyway, that's a whole nother discussion. Go ahead, Thompson. You know, uh, uh, there's many times, you know, like, for example, Matthew 9, 13, mm-hmm. uh, Jesus said, go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, that's not dismissing sacrifice. Same thing in Matthew 23, 23. You, you tithe, you know, uh, you, you tithe your spices, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, yeah. and uh, uh, those types of things. And so, I mean, uh, uh, there's, the, you know, there's the understanding, yes, this is God's law, but life happens. But when life yeah. happens, it is, uh, for lack of a better, it's an exception. It, it It's not a precedent to say, okay, well, I can set aside what God has told me to do it every other time because of this one exception. You know, you know how often do people want to make the arguments, you know, you know, the, you know, the baptism, you know, what if somebody dies on the way to the baptistry or, you know, so somebody's in a foxhole and he's decides he needs to be baptized, but he gets killed before he gets to the, the, the baptism. You know, those are exceptions, you know, and, 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 you know, God's going to do what God's going to do. Uh, but that doesn't change what he said. And, and, and yeah. that's, that's really, that's really the bottom line of it. And, and of course, Jesus is pointing out, and I think we, we need to think about this and in, in everything, you know, this is a great passage. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Use compassion as you judge. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes compassion means you still have to be harsh because that's what's needed for the circumstance, depending on what it is. But that's what Jesus is driving home in all of this. And incidentally, this is a passage that tells you there is a time to judge. You know, yeah. when, when people, uh, the, the, this is a passage that qualifies uh, Matthew 7. Uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, which people love to, love to quote. You know, yeah. Bible says, do not judge, you know, you know, you know, do not judge. No, the Bible doesn't say do not judge without clarifying what he means. And all you got to do is look down a couple of verses past that to see that Jesus isn't saying all judging is wrong. Uh, you know, when he said, do not cast your pearl before swine, what's he telling you to do? Make a judgment. So, I mean, here you've got this passage, judge, judge with righteous judgment. And get all your facts together before you make your judgment. And by the way, that's the point of Matthew chapter 7 as well. So anyways. You're right. I've always thought it strange that people don't have any trouble judging us for judging them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, they're judging. You can't, you can't do anything without making judgments. Yep. Yep. All right. Let me see. My camera is acting up on me. Bear with me just a moment. Let's see if it'll come back in proper. So, all right. One more thought, real quick, as as I work with this, on verse twenty four, what we're talking about in this case in point, the context they're trying to they're judging whether or not Jesus has sinned. Okay. Effectively, would you say that would be an accurate statement there? You know, they're, they're making a judgment calls whether or not he's in violation of the law. And in this case in point, he was not. And this is where their, their judgment was an error because it was not based on the proper information, the righteous judgment. Same thing today. If we're going to call it, say a brother's guilty of sin, then we need to make certain that we know all the facts of the situation and make the proper determination as to that. All right. Any thoughts? Absolutely right. All right. So let's continue forward, picking up with verse 25. And there's some discussion as to who this Jesus might be. And we um, let's go ahead and Tom, I'm going to throw this back to you. I'm not going to bother reading my, my cameras decided to flake out on me again. So um, pick up verse 25 and let's go ahead and read this down through verse 31, if you would. Okay, all right. Okay, we read there, it says, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. 
And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid hands on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? All right. So, coming back to the start of this section here in verse 25. Um, the, so, in this case in point, now they're drawing an interesting conclusion. Isn't he the one that they're trying to kill? So, they were aware, Tom, of the, the Jewish leaders' efforts to at least try to kill Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and yeah. that's interesting when you go back. He said, why do you seek to kill me? You have a demon. Who, who's trying to kill you? Well, you know what? There was some in that very audience. <laughs> uh, there were some in the very audience. That, you know, isn't this the one they're trying to kill? You know, yeah. so, so obviously. Fully aware. There, yeah, there were some that knew. And so, so and, and Jesus knew, by the way. And of course, Jesus knew because Jesus was Jesus. <laughs> and and. And so he, he was, he knew their hearts, he knew their motives, he knew everything about them. And so you have that observation here and, and they're making the point and they're wanting to know if this is the one they want to kill, they want to more than likely stone to death right now for right. a blast. That's what they want to do. Um, um, and say, but look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Uh, so what, what do they know that we don't know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good way of saying that. That's a good way of saying that. If they've not killed him yet, then what do they know that we don't know? Could he truly be the Christ? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And remember that term Christ, Messiah, yeah. the the one that they were looking for, the deliverer they wanted. Whenever the term Christ is used in these texts, that's what's in mind. Yeah. Yes, it's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Messiah. The Anointed. Greek word are though. Okay. But Bob, what we're reading now in verse 27 shows us that not everyone knew what they needed to know about the teachings of the scriptures regarding the coming of the Messiah. For instance, in this case in point, what was their misunderstanding in verse 27? Uh here, they didn't understand, apparently, a whole lot, <laughs> but uh, didn't understand the Messiah would come from heaven. They didn't understand his deific nature, that he would be a member of the Godhead. Uh, they must not have been familiar with the uh, with Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, or, or yeah, Micah, mm -hmm. uh, which... Herod's wise men knew about. He's going to be born, born in Bethlehem. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they didn't know necessarily, these people here, that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. But they knew he was from Nazareth, and that's probably what they were referring to. But it was even implied in the prophets that he shall be called a Nazarene. Even if those words, quote-unquote, are not found in the uh uh, in the Old Testament, uh, I think it's Matthew that tells us that, yeah, that was the prophecy. That was what the prophets uh, said in, in general terms, uh, because he would come from a, a, uh, a city that had no great reputation, implying that he would have no great reputation. Yeah. And so... Uh, they, but, you know, it, they were oblivious to all of this. And, and you know, like a lot of uh, people today, even even in same, even in congregations, you've got different levels of Bible knowledge. And so it's no surprise here that you've got people who know some things about the Scripture and, and not other things. And some of them are a little more astute than others in various areas. Uh, and some less astute in those areas, but more astute in other areas. And, uh, and, and there's no unanimity here. This, these are just people, not, uh, organ, not an organization. It's not just the Pharisees. 
but uh, I mean, references made here to the Pharisees as if it was a second, a secondary group. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there's just a wide range of, of knowledge and speculation and, uh, some people just didn't know much at all about the Messiah. That's right. Yeah. And you can kind of yeah. see, like you said, that's a great point today. You hear it, see a bunch of people standing around talking about something religious and how many different viewpoints do you have? Yeah. T Tom, you got a thought. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and building on that, you know, something that I see in this verse, and maybe I'm wrong on it, but uh, um, it seems to me that they knew that this Messiah that they were looking for was special. And and what I mean by that, I, I look at this text, it doesn't surprise me if, if they're expecting something supernatural associated with the Messiah. You know, with the fact that we don't know where he comes from, we don't know, we don't know the details of his background or things like that. Kind of, uh, kind of makes you wonder about. Was it Psalm one ten? Uh, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and and you know some of those things that they didn't fully understand. So I, I, I kind of wonder if there was a sense in which uh, they knew the the Messiah. He was going to be special. Not they didn't necessarily think he was going to be God. Mm -hmm. But but they thought there was things special about him, you know, calling him the prophet and things associated with that. So you've got these supernatural ideas, and, and th that's tied into this phrase here. You know, we don't know where he's going to come from, but that, like Bob pointed out, there are passages that give us clues as to who he was if they tied those to the coming Messiah. You know, so. Yeah. Um, one thing to note here, John does remind us, he had already made this point earlier in, let's see, where was it? Verse 14. Okay. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. John reminds us now in verse 28 that he's still in the temple teaching. Because he says that Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, and so that's another reason why these people are looking on a little bit disbelief that the Jewish leaders are allowing him to continue to, to teach because he's teaching here in the temple. But he's, he says in verse 28, you both know me and you know where I am from. Goes back to, and a little bit later, verse 42, we'll be coming back to uh, someone will bring up, or John will bring up the reference to Micah 5, verse 2, um, that Bob pointed out a while ago, I believe it is. He says, you know me and you know where I am from. And I'm not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know me. But when he says, you know me and you know where I am from, he's not talking about from Bethlehem, is he? Hmm? No, I don't. He's talking about heaven. Yeah. Because he's already identified that his father sent him. Uh, and and that, that, that implies heaven. Because yeah. it's impl implied that he was talking about God. And, and his very words as well as his miracles testified to the fact that he was from heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He says, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. And this goes right. back to what we we're talking about earlier. He says, yep, but they I got it. Yep. Uh, and, and that's the point. I mean, they, uh, they understood what Jesus was claiming. Yeah. They, they, they just weren't willing to take the time to investigate the validity of what he was claiming. You know, sometimes uh, people know the truth and don't even realize they know it and, uh, and expose their knowledge in arguing against it. And, uh, and I think that's kind of what is happening here. They, they're saying, well, we don't know where the Messiah, where the Messiah is coming from. Uh, we don't know where you're from. Uh, he said, well, yeah, you know where I am from. Uh, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Clearly a reference to the one who sent him from heaven, yeah. who was God. Yeah. That's a good point. You don't know it, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Yeah. And, 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 you know, yeah. Uh, it's interesting when you look at the statement that is made here. Uh, uh, 
it said in the verses just prior to this that they're surprised that the rulers were not taking him. I mean, they're accusing him of blasphemy. He's making a statement that if it is not true, is blasphemy. And I'm talking about, you know, claiming to be from God if it were not true. But yet they can't touch him. They, they can't touch him because of the circumstance. And, and, and the, crowds, the crowds see this. I, I, I wonder how often it was when somebody was genuinely guilty of blasphemy. I wonder how long they lived. <laughs> You know, you know, I mean, you know, you know, in, in, in the temple complex, Especially how long do you public. think it would have, yeah, yeah, in public, how long do you think it would have taken them to get them out on a hillside and, and stone them to death? You know, uh, I, I pro, pro, I, and I know there's a discussion there. What were they legally allowed to do and so on, those kinds of things. But here Jesus is making these statements. He's made them over and over. They can't touch them. And they can't touch them because of the crowd because they know that before they can do anything to him, they have to discredit him first. They have to assault his character, you know, in order to be able to get away with getting rid of him. And, you know, and people are noticing that here. In Acts chapter seven, uh, when uh, Stephen, you know, regales them with their own history of God's dealing with him. They, they listen very attentively, but when he finally uh, lowers the boom, yeah. calls them uncircumcised and stiff necked, uh, it didn't take them long at all to stone him. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that, and that's the point. And, and the people see this, the people see this and, and, and they're, they're amazed at it. And so you've got things, you've got things happening here where, you know, uh, you know how you, uh, you know the expression about the same sun, the same sun that melts butter hardens clay. You, you you've got a mixed audience here, and, and while this is while some are hardening themselves against Jesus, there are others who are observing what's happening, and they're softening, as a result of it. Well, let's talk about that for just a minute. Verse thirty-one, Tom. In verse 31, and this is the New King James translation, and many of the people believed in him and said, here, here's what they're saying. When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Now, I want to bring in real quick the New American Standard Version. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, will he not perform more signs than those which this man has done? Will he? In other words, it sounds like what they're saying is, isn't this man the Messiah? When the Messiah comes, is he going to do any more works than what this fella has already done? Um, yeah, I think that statement there goes back to what you're talking about. Their hearts were softened and they believed. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, it's interesting. I wonder how many of that crowd was the leaders. You know, I, I mean, yeah. at least softening. You know, we, we know at least two of the council were followers of Jesus. Yeah, uh, uh, Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah, Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. And you're going to read later on in Acts chapter what is it six or seven? Many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So, so, so you've got the idea of um, hearts are softening. Hearts are softening as these things are happening here, and uh, and Jesus is going to amass his following. You know, he, he's he, what's going to be the core that he's going to start with. You know, it seems to me that this statement implies that they're thinking, if this man is not the Christ, uh, what are we going to expect of the Christ? Is it okay. possible that the Christ, if this man is not Christ, could do more miracles than this man has done? Remember, uh, well, we haven't gotten there yet in our study, but in John 9, uh, he heals uh, uh, a man born blind. Mm -hmm. and, and that man says, this ain't never happened before. There was no record of it in the Old Testament. No prophet ever recovered sight to the blind. And yet Jesus did. And he did. And that was only the first of several times. Uh, and so... Uh, 
that's just the extent of which uh, to which Jesus had power over uh, anatomy, uh, physiology, and uh, and 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 nature itself. And so, how time, could anybody do time, more? Time, birth defects. Yeah. Add those to the list of things that had power. Jesus had power on. Sorry to interrupt. Well, this goes back to even the prophecies, and this is the, the, the things when John sent his disciples to Jesus, Jesus said, go back and tell John that you saw the blind given sight and the deaf given ability to hear, and these things because of, as a prophecy, they talk about the things that the Messiah would do, restore the sight, restore the ability to hear, restore, you know, healing leprosy, raising the dead even, you know, these were, the, these miracles, there were miracles done in the Old Testament, but these miracles would be, I would think, what would you say, unique to the Messiah? Yeah. At least at that point, of course. Yeah. We've got, I don't know if anybody heals uh, a blind man in the book of Acts or not, but certainly a man uh, born uh, lame mm -hmm. was given the ability to walk. Uh, I'm well, who's sure. who's the first mute 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 man whose muteness was healed in the New Testament? That would be Zacharias. Yeah, and that was because he was made mute by God, <laughs> by the angel, and he was but given the ability to hear uh, to speak again. Yeah, with yeah. the birth of John. But I think Tom made a good point. A lot of these things that we see Jesus doing, people were born this way. There may have been some accidents that had happened, but a lot of these situations, even coming into Acts, people were born lame, born blind, and so forth. Right. Okay. Let's see, any other thoughts on this? We are down to nearing the end of our study. I don't know if we wanna get into um, the next section, what do you think? We have about six minutes left. Um, we can give the people a break. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> could go back and talk a little bit more about circumcision. Mm -hmm. yeah. If Jesus had been present uh, when any baby was circumcised, he could have instantly uh healed the wound caused and and uh, so that there wouldn't be a need for a bandage uh wouldn't be any need for uh, recovery and of course of course the baby is not that conscious well i don't know uh, but uh remember what levi and simeon did uh when uh dinah was uh uh yeah. either mm -hmm. produced or raped or whatever. Mm -hmm. They went in and killed all the men while they were recovering from circumcision. They agreed, well, we'll be circumcised. You'll let our, let our son Shechem yeah. uh, marry the daughter. And, Wasn't uh, it in the third day of their suffering that they go in? Yeah. 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 So we all know with infants, things done at a much earlier age is so less of a traumatic event. If you have to have your child's tonsils removed, it's better for it to be done earlier than later. You know, yeah. an 18 month old undergoing tonsil surgery versus a 10 year old, even the healing time's gonna be faster. Um, and so the same thing, the circumcision is so early, eight days into their being born that the, the trauma is something they'll never remember. I mean, it's so, you know, I, I was uh, maybe eight or nine when I had my tonsillectomy. And uh, I remember what is now called a bad trip. The effects <laughs> of the ether. And the ether. it was awful. But, you know, what overshadows that is the taste of the ice cream that I was given later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, and not, not to get too, too graphic with this, but the cutting utensils they would have used back then. Yeah. Sharp have, rock. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Surely they had metal. I mean, surely they they had you know sharpened metals and stuff. But but the whole you think about the cleanliness, the oh, yeah. preventing of. I mean, just so so much greater challenge. But they did it. Tom made an interesting point earlier. Even on the Sabbath day, think about the size of Israel. All the firstborn males were supposed to be brought to the temple to be presented to the Lord, and there would be an offering that the people would have to offer in lieu of the firstborn going to the Lord. And right. so think about the number of baby boys that would have been presented to the Lord. You know, we're talking about a procedure that could have been 10 a day, 20 a day, 30 a day, just for 10, and that's just on the eighth day of the week or the seventh day. Um, not to mention just any given day of the week. Yeah. And that's local, much less the temple. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's true. But, but did, did, well, it was all, wasn't it only the firstborn male that had to be taken to the temple to be presented to the Lord? Or was all male think, children had to be presented? I, I, think that's, I think that's the case. Uh, but I think going to the temple primarily was the cleanliness of the, uh, of the mother. Uh, she would be unclean after giving birth until such time as she went to the temple and uh, performed the uh, the cleansing ritual. Before, Which but, was incidentally 33 days for a male and 66 days for a female. That's okay. it. Yeah, that's right. Circumcision done on the eighth day, the, pres the presenting yeah. of the baby, that's a valid point. I, I was, had that off there. Yeah, they wouldn't go to the temple for the circumcision. That's right. Yeah, but yeah. still think about that presentation. What if it yeah. was on a Saturday? <laughs> that's true something else you know, yeah. so, anyways well my camera is frozen up again so that tells me it's pretty much time for our study to be over with okay so <laughs> I don't know what's going on actually I think I do know what's going on this camera is a USB 3 and I'm using a USB 2 extension and I don't know that could be causing it um could be the driver too. So that being the case, let's go ahead and plan to, to bring our study to a close. Let's plan, Lord willing, to continue our study next Thursday. We'll pick up with verse 32. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with verse 32 of John chapter seven. Um, any other thoughts? Well, good. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening. We, we didn't have any comments today, but, but thank you all for listening. Yeah. It meant they agreed with everything that we said and we filled it in so perfectly that there wasn't any room. <laughs> well, kidding. I guess we shouldn't talk about who's absent then, right? Yeah, it could be, could be too. Everybody's just busy and, and we're, we're just noise in the background to keep them from getting bored. So. Yeah. Right. All righty. So we'll, we will continue our study, of course, next uh, Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. If you have any thoughts or comments you want to share with us, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. We would most definitely love to hear from you. Well, that's it for this week. We'll see you again next Thursday. John chapter 7, verse 32. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.